Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Our guest today, Kirk Halpern. Kirk, it's good to have you on. I appreciate you being here. And can you tell us, first of all, where you're calling in from and what you do for a living with farmers and fishermen purveyors? Okay, great. Well, I'm calling in from Norcross, Georgia, which is a suburb of the greater Atlanta area. Farmers and fishermen purveyors. I started it on July 1, 2019. And we are a leading supplier of seafood steaks and specialty items, predominantly to leading restaurants in North Georgia, Tennessee, and beyond. That's amazing. I guess what kind of tell me a little bit more about your background and what got you uh, you know wanting to work in this space with you know meat and fish distribution and you know when you started the company in 2019 what did you kind of notice out there in the market that you were trying to do a little differently or better when you started this brand? All right, Matt, on this one it's going to be a little bit of a longer story because it's going to be a life story. Sure. So when I grew up as a kid, as old from when I was eight years old, and you can tell from the gray hair I'm a little bit older, but my maternal grandfather was a major player in the produce business down in Miami, Florida. He actually was the guy who invented putting strawberries and pints, pints and flats, potatoes and cardboard box. And I would, uh, on Friday nights, I'd spend the night from as young as when I was eight years old. And Saturday morning at three in the morning, I would go in with, initially I'm sorting lemons, handling cucumbers. You can go through every bit of the different veg, fruit and vegetable group. And I did that as a kid up through and I worked at his place in high school. And again, he was a purveyor of produce to some of the finest hotels and restaurants in the South and Southern Florida. I go off to Florida State undergrad. I go to Duke Law School. I practiced law for a year and a day and I hated it because I didn't feel I was building anything. And there's a there's a scene where Richard Gere in the movie Pretty Woman is taking glasses and putting them upside down and kind of building into a cast. And George Costanza comes rushing and says, what are you doing? And he says, well, you know, when I was a kid, I liked to build and I'm not building anything. And then Richard Gere then goes off and does what Richard Gere does. And similarly, I left the practice of law. I had called my father the day before I was going in for a review with the top legal partner of the firm. I said, Dad, I'm looking to jump. Do I got a parachute? He said, pull the cord. And I joined my father's company at the time, which was in a company called Buckhead Beef Company. At the time, my dad had started in 83. I joined him in 89. We were a $20 million company. And from 89 to 99, we grew to $135 million a year. In 99, he sells the company to Cisco, SYY, New York Stock Exchange. And we continue to run the company and we grew a big. A bucket beef truck left the World Trade Center 15 minutes before the plane hit. We were all throughout the eastern United States. Well, in 2005, my dad got a divorce from Cisco, kind of pushed him out. No hard feelings. And I was in very good shape, but they wanted to kind of remake up the business. And I met with the CEO of Cisco, and I said, my family doesn't own this company. You all own it. If this is what you want to do, I should be the first guy you knock out. It's kind of like mentioning the divorce word to your wife. Once you mention it, you can't pull it back. The week later, I had I get a call from the guy that was at the front of the plant. He says, Mr. Alpern, you have three visitors. said, I wasn't expecting anyone. Who is it? He rattled off the name of the general counsel of Cisco, the number three at Cisco, and another guy I turned to my admin. I said, start packing up my stuff. They asked for me to resign. I resigned. The next day, I drank beer. The next day, I met counsel. And I knew I can start a competing company. So I did. And I started a company called Halpern Steak and Seafood on April 28th of 2005. And we were a fast growth company. Year one, we did 12 million. Year two, we did 74 million. Year three, we did 135 million. And then at the end of 2014, we decided to put ourselves up for a liquidity event. We sold the business on January 4th of 2015. I did three years of an earnout. I had negotiated in 18 months of a non-compete. And I said, okay, what is it that I want to do? And during the 18 months of my non-compete, it was like wandering around in the desert trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And what I came down to is I said, you know, what do I really want. One, I'm a build. So I want to build some. Two, I want to chase being perfect. I want to be as perfect as I can be. And then third, I had really enjoyed mentoring my nephew. And my nephew who started when he was 18 years old, I'm talking about my previous company, 10 years later, he's running all of Florida for us. And I said, man, that was great. I love to do that with my son. So on July 1, 2019, the day after my non-compete was over, on June 30th of 2019, I opened up Farmers and Fishermen. And now we're four and a half years in and 
we are the leading steak seafood specialty company in the marketplace and we're considered by many to be probably one of the hottest companies in the country that's amazing yeah and so you kind of took your experience and obviously you know being a part of the first business with your father running your own business after that and now like just trying to do it again and becoming cl- as close to perfect as you possibly can i guess the third time around and, and kind of do working in this space again right the two previous companies we were growth company and both both of our previous companies were fast growth and very large and what i wanted to do on this one is i wanted to be as perfect as possible and that's what i'm doing yeah no it's amazing and i guess i'm curious i feel like this is kind of a new advent especially in the direct to consumer side of your business and what you're doing what kind of got you interested in doing that it's, it sounded like when the other two companies and correct me if i'm wrong you're doing mostly kind of b2b selling to restaurants selling to kind of wholesalers or other distributors what kind of got you going down the d2c route this time around so matt great question adversity reveals character and ability and so what happens is i started farmers and fishermen july 1 2019 and i got at this small little burn burning a little money in july burning a little money in august i get to about january 2020 i said man i think i'm breaking even i get to february i'm starting to feel good man by march i got my chest busted out and i'm feeling really good and what happened is the week before march 16th the stock market drops 3,000 points we start talking about covid and on monday march 16th market drops 2,000 points and the governor camp is going to go on and i was out i was going to go visit customers and all of a sudden i'm, I'm watching the entire industry just getting decimated and governor camp announces that he's going to call for the shutdown of all the restaurants hospitality in the state of georgia which means in a single moment i'm going to lose 97 percent of my customers and i get myself disheveled and i turn and i said man let me get home because i was actually getting myself lost in atlanta and i'm on the phone with a fellow by the name of marty mazetta mazetta seafood power seafood company so marty what are you going to do he says man i'm kirk i'm 62 tommy his older brother 67 i'm we're going to get sequestered in. At the same time he tells me that, I'm pulling into my driveway and my wife who had previously sent out, because there were runs in, in all the grocery stores, and my wife has sent out a text to four or five of her friends said, hey, if you need steak, you need seafood, let me know. I'll go to the plant and I'll have it. So I pull into the driveway and I see five of my wife's friends all surrounding my wife's SUV getting this order, that order. And I say to myself, I said, man, we took care of my wife's friend who's taking care of the community and i grab my yellow legal pad first thing i actually do is i sit down on my living room floor and i start counting money said okay if i shut down this i'm gonna lose a million and a half here i had two million dollars in receivables maybe i get 20 percent of it i'm gonna lose this i'm gonna do that and i started counting and i said you know what this will hurt but i'll survive but i didn't see any leadership coming from government or from elsewhere and i said you know this is a time where this is when we're when we define who we are. At the same time I'm doing this, I'm also the board chair, I'm the chairman of the board for Goodwill North Georgia. Our mission is to put people to work. And I had really, really good people that when I opened up farmers and fishermen said, you know what, I trust Mr. Howell. I will leave my job and go work with him. And I said, okay, if I roll, what happens to them? And I said, I'm not going to roll. It took me 13 hours and in 13 hours, I developed my business plan. I had the, uh, that I was going to implement the next day. I had all my employees on the line and everybody was scared because everybody in my space, every food service distributor were just knocking out people left, knocking out people right. And I said to them, I said, look, the last time an asteroid hit this planet, the guys ruling the planet, the dinosaurs went extinct. And if you believe in evolution, there was a prehistoric gnarly rat, which was our forefathers, if you believe in it, and that this rodent was able to move and pivot and go fast. And I said, that's who we're going to be. We are going to pivot, pivot, pivot. We're going to move and what we're going to do is there's going to be no firing, no furloughs, no reduction in pay, no reduction in benefits. And as we go through this and as we grow through COVID, then what we're going to do is I'm going to hire the spouses and the family members of my employees who got knocked out. And in 13 hours, we're up and running as a B2C supplier and we never were before. I never took an American Express card before, never made a home delivery before, but that became our business model. And that allowed us to convert inventory into cash flow. It learned us to burn down a whole bunch of different stuff. It allowed me to keep my people working. And because of that, I then became stronger and stronger and stronger in the marketplace. That's amazing. I love that story. And I appreciate you sharing that. And so I guess fast forward here to 2024, you make that huge pivot. It obviously becomes the biggest part of your business at that time. Fast forward to 2024 here. How big of a, the side of the business is the D2C channel still to this day in 2024 for you? It, great question. It's really small. If I was to do a logical analytical part, I'd say, man, I should 
should probably end it, but I didn't and I don't. Two reasons. One, because during COVID, we had so many people ask us, you know, well, after COVID, are you going to keep the service? And I gave my word. I said, yeah, we're going to keep. So I said it, we're doing it. That's what we do. That's number one. Number two, what we've been able to do is we've been able to synergize our B2B with our B2C. So for example, I could be talking to a chef, the top premier chef, who maybe he's opened a new restaurant and he's looking for an added boost. I say, look, you do a great lamb shank dish. You do a great dish. Why don't I do this? Why don't I feature a raw lamb product shank as part of my farmers and fishermen blast? Because I got 20,000 different customers that still get the blast. To them, it's like food art. It's like me looking, even though I'm not buying a car, I love looking at magazines that have cars. Okay. And I said, and what I'll do is I'll blast that out. I'll blast out your recipe, your favorite recipe you use. I'll feature your restaurant. So now all of a sudden I'm doing cross marketing. So somebody can say, wow, I now have that available and it gives me an advantage in my marketplace on my business to business because I touch so many consumers. And what I've also found is quite frankly, I've gotten such great press and such great results by remaining in the business to consumer space that if I just remained in business, I wouldn't be getting as much favorable talk. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And it's definitely something I find having so many conversations with CPG brand owners on the podcast, which is basically like that omni-channel sort of approach doing the D2C, even a B2C or you know, business to other corporations sometimes. And I'd be explaining that like connector role, having those like multiple revenue streams is really important. I think, especially coming out of COVID, if people realize like, you know, a really big chunk of your business can kind of be ripped away at any given time. I mean, if something like that ever happens again or a financial, like an economic downturn, I mean, who knows? But I think that was really like an eye opener for a lot of people. And that's amazing. I appreciate you sharing your perspective on that. And I think a lot of people listen to the podcast are kind of, you know, just getting their feet wet into the CPG space for the first time. So your, your perspective and, you know, running this business for as long as you haven't been in this industry for as long as you have is really valuable. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I know I mentioned before we hopped on here as well, Kirk, that there's one question I do always love to ask on the podcast. And I'm really interested to hear your answer to this as well. I guess, you know, speaking of your most recent venture here with the, you know, the business we're talking about now, if you go back to 2019 and you know, do anything a little bit differently and give yourself any one piece of advice, what do you think that would be? Great question. I'm going to give you two answers. First answer is, I did this for most of it, but there's still a couple of pieces that I missed. When you're building a business, you're always looking and saying, okay, if this goes right, this happens, this happens, this happens, and this is what makes sense. And I've always looked, well, here's the countervailing, well, if that doesn't happen, then what the result is. I think I did a really good job in always accelerating and breaking at the same time. Where I think it gets a little bit tougher is it gets tougher for your employees to follow it and to know when you're actually making a turn and not making a turn. Everybody wants to be in. Everybody wants to contribute. And I think if you look back at it, sometimes as leadership, we talk too fast thinking folks get and they may not see it, they may not understand it. So I think if I was to go backward at inception, I would have done maybe a little bit better job. But because this is my third turn at the wheel, I think I execute it really well. I would say that in the business to consumer space, because I built that business overnight, the one mistake I made from a long-term venture of that business, because again, I went under the basis, I want to serve the community and I wanted to keep my people working those were my two primary concerns. I didn't on day one say, okay, whatever I build in my business to consumer, I want to retain and capture that. I wasn't factoring that part. Had I done what I would have and should have done, and again, I was building a race car at the same time I'm driving, but what I would have done different is I would have went more to a subscription model. And I didn't do it because I was focusing on serving the community. But I think if I would have gotten folks engaged on a subscription model, where okay, this is what we're going to factor out each month, then when COVID passed, and I still get all these great favorables. I mean, I was up, I'm up for an award and, and a couple of the judges said, man, Mr. Halpern, you got me through COVID. I love your company. They love my company, but they haven't bought in the last 60 days. If I would have done a subscription model, they would have said, Mr. Halpern, I love your company and I'm still buying. So that would have been the one thing I would have done different from the business to consumer side. Yeah, no, it's fair enough. I think those are both really good pieces of advice. And it's obviously something you see, you know, in these kind of D2C, you know, food and drink categories that definitely 
monthly subscription models are, are huge right now. And I, I think people actually prefer that as a motive, especially with things that you're consuming on a regular basis. You're buying, you know, some meat or fish like for your family. I mean, that's something you're going through quickly. So no, it definitely makes sense. And to your first point as well, uh, when it comes to, you know, thinking about your employees and finding good fit for those types of things, what advice would you give somebody that's starting a business that's looking to grow their team is experiencing growth? Like what kind of check boxes do you have when you look for people that either you're bringing on as employees or even like maybe from the outside as, as contractors? What do you kind of look for in those relationships? Okay. So actually, I'm going to answer that second part of the question first. I've now been leading meat slash seafood companies in this space for the last 35 years. I'm an old guy. Okay, I've been doing it 35 years. I will tell you that my model that I now use for hiring, especially on sales representatives, I've made a completely changed model seven or eight months ago. Completely different model. I used to look for people that had subject matter expertise. You know, I was hiring folks that were in food service sales. Many of them were chefs. Many of them had product knowledge. And quite candidly, I operate in a space with a lot of flawed players. And that's what I was hiring. And what happened is is I continually have been disappointed by work ethic and coachability, too much stubbornness, too much this, too much that. And I just don't have the patience to fight it. And what happened is I was interviewing two folks on Zoom, you know, separately. And one of the guys had all of the qualifications, all the qualifications. But the guy before him that I spoke to really had very few. He was diligent. He was respectful. And the guy who didn't have the experiences, I turned around and I said to him, I said, look, I said, tell you what, I come into my plant Saturday morning. I'm usually here by 5.30. Why don't you come visit me at 6.30 in the morning? We'll talk in person. Second interview, we'll talk in person. Second, the other guy, which I'll now refer to as the second guy, he had all the things on his resume. I said, why don't you come see me at 7.30 in the morning? Great. The first guy pulled up into my plant at 6.10 in the morning because he wanted to be early. He waited respectfully 10 minutes in his car. And then 6.20, he sent me a text. He said, Mr. Halpern, you know, he deferred, called me by my formal name. Mr. Halpern, I'm in the parking lot. I can remain here for 10 minutes or if you want, I can come in or, you know, I come in early and see you. I said, great. Andy Warhol once said, 85% of life is showing up. He showed up at 6.30. The other guy who had everything on the resume at eight o'clock at night on the Friday turns and he sent me a text and he says, Kirk, so he rounded me down. He said, Kirk, when I said yes, I forgot I need to take my daughter to soccer practice. Now, earlier in the conversation, he declared that he's in a married relationship. The wife doesn't work and he hadn't had a job in 120 days. He said, so I'm not going to be able to see you. I'll need to call you later in the week to reschedule. Okay. Well, if he had a day to figure out how he can get his daughter covered, it wasn't a soccer game. It was a soccer practice. Hey, who else on the team can show... Who else on the team are you friends with? Maybe you spend the night or maybe the mom can take her. And so at the end of the day, I said, the guy who showed up at 630, he's going to show up every day. The other guy, maybe he shows up, maybe he doesn't. So now what I go out and what I'm always doing is I'm looking for who's the guy, and I say that gender neutral, who's going to show up, who's going to work hard, who's going to be coachable so I can teach him his crafts and his industry and his business so he can supply for his family. That's yeah. what I do with employees now. That's amazing. I really love that story. And I mean, it's definitely something I've heard before when, you know, whenever I ask questions about employment, which is basically that the relationship is many times more important than the on-paper qualification. I think that's a really important thing you know, to just have some nuance about because you, know, you can just put everybody as numbers on a sheet of paper and just pick the one that has the longest experience and the most like you know, you know contractual ability seemingly for what you're looking for but you know i think kind of having like so almost like a test i think inadvertently you kind of did with these two people that you were looking to hire i think you know obviously shed a lot of light on you know probably something you should have learned or would have learned the hard way if you hadn't done that so i think the point is really well taken i appreciate you sharing that and, and let me follow up on that real quick sure what a resume can never show you a resume can never show you heart mm -hmm. and as business owners what we want is we want the people who care that are going to that are going to give their heart. You know, who do you want? If you ever watch the movie Rudy, you want Rudy. If you ever watch replacement players, you want Keanu Reeves. You want heart. So how do you measure heart? You can't measure heart from a resume. No, it's so true. And it's definitely something I resonate with myself only because when I got my start into sales, my first job actually was still bartending at the time. I was in food service a very long time, almost 10 years managing like bartending serving. And I met somebody who was a, a manager at a local place that was hiring software sales and I'd never done sales, but he just happened to like me. If I like, you know, made a joke with his wife, I had this wife lab, was playing with his kid at the restaurant. And you know, he asked me if I ever been in sales before. And I said, no. And we just ended up having a conversation. I called his cousin who also had worked there. 
there and they really took a chance on me. So I kind of had that chip on my shoulder going in saying like, you know, a lot of people came in with a lot of experience. I thought they knew how to do it. And like, you know, they were trying to fit, you know, old th ways they were doing things into a new position and it didn't really work. And me coming from the outside in, I knew that basically my perspective was like, I don't know better than any of these people. I don't know any, I don't know the first thing about selling. And I'm like, but yet here I am. So I better do more than everybody else. Cause that's the only way I'm going to keep up. I'm obviously always super thankful for that. And I think they kind of took that perspective too. I'd like to think that they kind of saw my drive to want to like, you know, put myself in a better position and myself, my friends and my family and the people around me just to kind of like do better than I was. So I appreciate your perspective on that. I think a lot of like, industries and experiences people have in you know, hiring in their careers right now, like I think a lot of people get just boiled down to numbers a, a bit too often nowadays. So I appreciate your kind of nuanced perspective on that. I think it's really valuable. And I think you can find, you know, some of the, the diamonds in the rough, so to speak, when it comes to hiring and uh, those relationships you have. So I appreciate that perspective. Yeah. You bet. Awesome. Well, Kirk, I just want to say thank you again for coming on. I really appreciate all your insights and your wisdom. I want to wish you the best of luck and continued success in everything that you're doing going forward. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to uh, staying in touch as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, we're very excited what we're doing at Farmers and Fishermen Purveyors. And you can look us up at www.farmersandfishermen.com. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Take care. Thank you very much, man. Yep. Link will be in the bio. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks.